So I'm actually not quite a lawyer yet. I will be soon, <laughs> but soon, soon. I'm a, the executive director with the East Coast Environmental Law Association. And what a pleasure it is to be with you all here today, part of this event. A few months ago, last fall, the David Suzuki Foundation called me up and asked me if I would give a presentation about environmental rights in Canada. And I said, sure, I would be happy to, I'd love to do it. And then I did not think about it again until a few days before I was scheduled to give the talk. And I found myself sitting at my kitchen table, staring at a computer screen, at a blank computer screen, not having a clue as to what I was actually going to say. And the thought of being up on that stage in front of a lot of people, just after an intermission and just before Dr. Suzuki was to take the stage, started to fill me with this sense of absolute dread. And in that moment of irrationality and slight amount of panic, I decided that the best possible thing I could do would be to go fishing. And so that's what I did. <laughs> My friend and I, we decided to, to take a walk, and we wandered down through these coastal heath barrens that are common around the outskirts of Halifax here, and it was huckleberry season. So we took baskets with us, and we started picking some huckleberries, and the cranberries were growing down closer to the shore, so we picked some of those too, and went fishing and caught a couple of fish. And as it happens, and quite fortunately for me, Going for a walk is not such a bad thing for writing a speech. And as, I'm, as my feet were wandering, so was my mind. And as I was sampling these berries that we were picking, and I was thinking about eating these fish that we had caught for supper later on that night, I began to think about people around the world who have toxic contaminants in their bodies because of the food that they eat. I thought of mothers who have toxic contaminants in their breast milk, which they pass on to their babies because of the food that they eat. And that started me thinking about the people up north, aboriginals and non-aboriginals, whose traditional foods are now laced with toxic contaminants, brought in by air and water currents and accumulating in the flesh of the food that they're eating. And I thought, how can it be? How can we be here in Canada and not have a right to live in an environment that does not compromise our health? And I thought about people in other parts of Canada, people in Sarnia, for example, people who are breathing polluted air and having it compromise their health, people that have to drink polluted water. And this is through no fault of their own, but simply because of where they happen to live. And how can that be here in Canada? Now, the tagline of these talks is ideas worth spreading. And I have to confess, that environmental rights is an idea that has been quite well spread. Spread around the world, in fact, over 90% of United Nations member countries have recognized in one form or another their citizens' right to live in a healthy environment. Somehow, Canada seems to have missed the memo on this one. Um, and it's not as if we don't have problems, environmental problems, here in Canada. The World Health Organization estimates that there's over 30,000 premature deaths every year in Canada due to environmental causes. In January of this year, we had 1,838 drinking water advisories in communities across Canada, 169 of which were in First Nations communities. <clears throat> and how uh, does think with the slides? And, uh, and Canada seems to be a global leader in deforestation, and unfortunately, we have our fair share of that right here in Nova Scotia. So, how do we explore, how do we get to achieving environmental rights here in Canada so that our children can have a right to live in an environment that's not going to compromise their health? Well, we can look to the federal government. The federal government could bring in a bill of environmental rights. Now, somehow, I don't think it's at the very top of Stephen Harper's agenda to bring in a bill on environmental rights, and I'm not even sure that it's on that agenda to begin with. But perhaps someday down the road, we'll see a federal government that sees the value in bringing in a bill of environmental rights for Canadians. What about here in Nova Scotia? We could have a provincial government bring in a bill of environmental rights. And now, I should say that some provinces and some territories 
have started down this direction, but so far in Canada, no province has yet to bring in a comprehensive and effective Bill of Environmental Rights. We could also look to our Charter, and our Charter as part of our Constitution, our Charter of Rights and Freedoms, as part of our Constitution, is a fundamental, most basic law in Canada that underlines all other laws in Canada. Amending the Constitution, amending the Charter, is not an easy task, and probably for good reason, and probably is not something that's going to happen anytime soon. But another avenue is that we could ask the courts whether or not environmental rights are inherently embodied within our Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and specifically in Section 7 of our Charter, which is our um, right to life, liberty, and security of the person. And security of the person basically refers to our health. And so there's a national organization, a national environmental law organization called EcoJustice, and they're actually doing this right now. They started the case back in 2010, and justice grinds along very slowly, as we all know. So it is yet to go to trial. We're hoping that the, tr that the case might go to trial sometime in, in this year, actually. And they're arguing on behalf of some residents of near, that live near Sarnia, Ontario, that the government has violated their right, their Section 7 right, to life, liberty, and security of the person by allowing hugely high levels of pollution in the air around their communities. That allegedly is causing a number of health impacts on these people, such as elevated levels of cancers, elevated levels of cardiovascular diseases, respiratory diseases, not, and, and uh, several others as well. So we'll see what happens when that, when that case goes to trial. And of course, last but not least, let's not forget about the municipalities. And communities all across Canada um, are endorsing environmental rights for the citizens. And, uh, and I say all across Canada, but so far we have yet to have a community in Atlantic Canada. So perhaps Halifax could be the first community in Atlantic Canada to bring in a declaration in support of human rights. I also hear that Cape Breton might be interested in doing this, so perhaps we can have a little friendly competition and see whether Halifax or Cape Breton will be first to stand up and endorse environmental rights for their citizens. So having environmental rights is, is all well and good, but there's a risk that they'll just be words on paper. If there aren't people who are willing to stand up and make sure that these rights are applied on the ground, <clears throat> and this is, of course, is what ha has happened in some countries, they simply remain words on paper. Now, there's lots of examples of the application of environmental rights on the ground, but I'm going to go to just, just one example. Let's go to the Philippines and Mr. Antonio Oposa. And Mr. Oposa is a lawyer in the Philippines who is quite concerned with the loss of the last remaining old-growth forests in his country, and of course, all of the biodiversity contained in those forests. So, he wanted the government to take back licenses that it had issued to forestry companies to cut the last remaining old-growth forests. And he took this case to court on behalf of children of the Philippines, and on behalf, which is kind of interesting from a legal perspective, on behalf of future generations of children in the Philippines. And he was arguing, arguing that the government was violating these children's right under Section 16, Article 2 of the Philippines Constitution, which states, and I'll, and I'll paraphrase, that all of its citizens have a right to a healthy and balanced environment. And the courts agreed. The Supreme Court of the, of the Philippines ordered the government to take away those licenses so that the last remaining old-growth forests would not be cut down and, and destroyed and lost. And the court said that the government has a legal obligation to make sure that the children of the Philippines and the future generations of children in the Philippines do not inherit a significantly degraded land. Now just imagine for a moment if such wisdom were applied here in Canada, here in Nova Scotia, You'd imagine if the courts told our government that they had a legal obligation to make sure that our children and our children's children do not inherit a significantly degraded land. Wouldn't that be just wonderful? 
So here's a photo of some of the forests that Mr. Uh, Pozo was working to save. So I recently, I went back to school, and uh, I'm not exactly sure why. I think it had something to do with the life crisis. It was either the classic motorcycle or go to law school, and I think if you were to ask me, I'd probably recommend the motorcycle. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, shortly after I finished my final exams, uh, somebody asked me what it was like to go to law school, and I think I probably had a bit of a, a dazed, faraway look in my eyes, and I said, well, it's kind of like taking a very, very long walk up a steep hill in a cold and driving rain, and you get to the top of that hill, and there's no view. <laughs> and you turn around, and you walk back down again. Um, but it's a, at, least a, at least a Dalhousie, um, when you are walking up that hill and you stumble, there's people there that are going to help you along, and when they stumble, you're going to help them along. So actually, it was a very good experience, a very positive experience. <laughs> some, some of the time. Um, the, um, I came to realize three things in particular when I was working my way through law school. And the first, and perhaps it's, it's obvious to say it, but the first is that law actually does matter. You know, we're embedded in this thing called law, and it's not just about crime and prisons, but really it affects almost every aspect of our daily lives. How we interact with each other, how we interact with the government, how the government interacts with us, there's hardly an aspect of our lives that's not shaped one way or another. And we create these laws, and then the laws shape our society. So law does matter. And the second thing I became, uh, became aware of is just how recent human rights are in Canada's history. In 1940, when my grandmother was 18, she's 93 now, in 1940, a man by the name of Mr. Fred Christie ordered a beer for himself and for a couple of friends at the Montreal Forum after watching the Canadiens play a game. And the Montreal Forum refused to serve him. So naturally, he was rather upset about this, so he took the situation to the courts, and the case worked its way all the way up to the Supreme Court of Canada. And the Supreme Court of Canada came down with a decision that the Montreal Forum and any other business in Canada was completely within its rights to refuse service to Mr. Fred Christie, all on the basis of the color of his skin. Now, it's a decision that would seem absolutely unfathomable to us here today, and yet that's the way it was. I think that we've come a long way. We have made a lot of progress in human rights in Canada since then. And by no means is far from perfect. Look to those living in abject poverty. Look to those with little access to justice or little ability to assert their rights. Yet nonetheless, we have made progress. But our work on human rights remains embarrassingly deficient when we have a situation in Canada where a child, through no fault of her own, just because of where she happens to live, can have her health compromised by polluted air or by polluted water or by contaminated soil that she might play in. And that brings me to my third point, and that is that law is not cast in stone. Law changes, law is malleable, law evolves, and it evolves due to pressure. Pressure from groups of people with a cause, pressure from individuals who are passionate about an issue, who want to correct an injustice, people like us. And changing law is not easy. It does require a heck of a lot of work, but it is entirely possible. And I think that the progress that we've made in human rights is a good example of how we can make change in law. I mean, how can we not have a right to breathe air in Canada that's not going to make us sick? How can we not have a right to drink water that's not going to make us sick? How can we not have a right to live in an environment in Canada that doesn't compromise our health? How can we not have a right to live in a healthy environment? Thank you very much. <laughs>